Okay, so this is the second part of wireless network design for cyber physical systems. So in the first part, we basically uh, reviewed um, critical interactive variables. So what are these critical interactive variables? Basically, we have a control and wireless communication system, and we want to design them together. Then they interact through this critical interactive variables. So what are these? Message delay, message dropout, and sampling period. So let's go back and remember what these are. So we basically have a sampling rate. So it can be a time-triggered system where you sample the system periodically, or uh, it can be an event-triggered system where basically the samples are generated depending on some trigger condition. And uh, whether it's a time-triggered sampling or event-triggered sampling, basically the higher the sampling rate, so you will have a, the better the, co uh, the uh, control system performance. Okay? But when we look at the wireless network design, the higher the sampling rate, actually the greater uh, the number of packets generated by the wireless networks, so this will result higher energy consumption. So we see the trade-off there. Okay? So when we look at the message delay, so remember, so when uh, we generate packets from the wireless network, so there's a queuing delay, so there's an access delay, and also transmission delay. And the lower the message delay, of course, the better the control system performance. But when we look at the wireless network part, so this requires higher data rate, better data encoding, decoding capability. So this has a cost, and this results in higher energy consumption. Okay? Again, there's a trade-off there. So the third critical uh, variable that uh, we identified is message dropout. So the lower message dropout, then the better the control system performance again. But th this has a cost again. So we need a higher transmit power to combat fading interference. And this is an extra cost on the system and results in a higher energy consumption. So this is the brief review of the first part. So basically what we will do today, we will look at the control system design. So how can we incorporate these critical interactive variables in the control system design? So, and uh, then we will look at the wireless network part. So what's the wireless network standardization for cyber physical systems? And how can we tune the parameters in these uh, wireless networks so that we have some control on the probabilistic distribution of these critical interactive variables? So let's uh, start with the control system design. Actually, uh, so control system design, so either you can do the analysis on, or design. Uh, so in the analysis part, uh, basically what you do, so you want a certain control system performance. And uh, to achieve that control system performance, you, put, you need to put some restrictions on the values of the critical interactive variables, which are sampling period, message delay, and message dropout. Okay? And you need to have a mathematical model for that. And this is really tough. And uh, uh, there are very few models that take into account all of these variables. And if you want to design wireless network, basically you need to take them all into account. So there are many models saying that, OK, I have zero delay. So what should be the uh, conditions on the message dropout probability? But with zero delay assumptions, so you can't use it in a wireless network. So this is not feasible. So that's the problem. Okay. So there are many such models. It, they are hard to uh, be integrated into the optimization problem. Okay. So there are a few models that I will talk about. And uh, then, the, so for the optimization, basically, you need to determine the requirements on the critical interactive variables for a certain control system performance. And also, you need to be interested in the control system design. So if you have message delay, message dropout, so how should you design your control system so that you can deal with them? So let's continue. So we basically classified all the work in the uh, control system design. So again, based on the sampling uh, period, so whether it's periodic or it's event-driven, so we have two groups, time-triggered sampling or event-triggered sampling. Then uh, we also classify time-triggered sampling strategies. So we call them hard sampling period or soft sampling period. So in the hard sampling period, so the assumption is that message delay should be less than sampling period. So the argument is that if message delay is larger than sampling period, so we have the next sample, so we don't need this old data anymore. Okay? So we can just use the new sample. Okay? And it's easier to do the analysis for hard sampling period. In the soft sampling period, 
we say that, okay, so the delay may be larger than the sampling period, but still it might be useful. Let's keep trying transmitting that data, okay? So it's harder to do the analysis for some sort of sampling period, basically. So it makes the system more complicated. Then uh, within the hard sampling period, so we also have two classes. So we have unbounded consecutive message dropout assumption, which means that uh, you can have, uh, so this is more realistic for wireless network because you always have non-zero message dropout probability and you can have uh, unlimited number of them, many message dropouts. But uh, there are also some work which assume that bounded, we have bounded consecutive message dropouts. So they say that the uh, message dropouts, so the maximum number of message dropouts, consecutive message dropouts sh can be five. But you can never give such guarantees in wireless network. And, uh, but there are some ways of adapting it for the design, so we will see that now. So let's start with the time triggered sampling. So the first one, hard sampling period. So we said that we have two basic classes. In the hard sampling period, message delay is smaller than sampling period. But in the soft sampling period, we say that we may continue to transmit these outdated messages, even if the delay is larger than sampling period. So within hard sampling period, so let's be, uh, there's another class, unbounded consecutive message dropout. So there are many works on that. And uh, the problem is that, so they have these unrealistic assumptions about like zero delay. So we have fixed delay, we have fixed sampling period, but what I'm interested in actually on the modeling of the control system performance as a function of all these three critical system variables. Otherwise it's not enough. So I don't understand the, I, don't, I can't do the optimization, right? And uh, there was a recent work on that. So they basically uh, formulated the control cost function as a function of these three uh, system variables. And uh, they used a the linear quadratic cost function and uh, differential equation. So the solution, so basically this is the control func uh, cost function as a function of uh, these three critical interactive variables we've been talking about. But uh, so the problem here is that so they use numerical methods to uh, determine this uh, number. So for a certain control system performance, what's the range of values for this critical system variables, okay? So when you determine these values uh, by using numerical methods, so the problem is that when you want to do optimization, again, you need to use numerical methods. And this, this, is re this gets really complicated, so it's better to identify the mathematical expressions, explicit formulas for the uh, relation between these critical interactive variables. And uh, uh, there are very few models doing that. So the next class, so we said that the first class uh, within the hard sampling period assumed that unbounded consecutive message dropouts. So the second class uh, basically assumed bounded consecutive message dropouts. So what do we mean by that? So this is the plant, so it's sampled periodically, okay? And uh, uh, the sensors send these sensors, uh, samples to the controller. And uh, we said that there's a certain delay associated with it, right? So due to channel access, queuing, and uh, transmission. And this is the delay. So basically they determine this maximum allowable <coughs> delay. So what's the maximum allowable delay for the transmission of the data, <coughs> sensor data, from the plant to the controller, okay? So this is the delay requirement. It should be less than maximum allowable delay. Then the second one is MATI, which is maximum allowable transfer interval. So what's that? It is the time interval between subsequent state vector uh, reports. So you get one sample here. So the delay of this sample may be larger than that, so anything can happen. And in between, some of the samples may be lost, okay? But what you are interested here is the time interval between the reception of one sensor data and the subsequent one, okay? So this should be less than this MATI, maximum allowed um, transfer interval. So what does it tell you, these requirements for the control system? When we think of the wireless network design, so we should, it's, it's good to understand the requirements of the control system when you do the wireless network design. So it tells us that actually you don't care about the packet losses which are distributed over time. 
So we only care about packet losses that are consecutive. Okay? So if I lose this and then this, then this might increases, right? So the time interval between subsequent state reports increases. So I care more about consecutive packet dropouts than the packet dropouts which are distributed over time. So I need to understand these requirements in the wireless network design. Okay? So the time interval then should be less than MATI. So then, so there are many uh, studies in the literature, so which study basically the trade-off curves of MATI and MAT for a certain control system performance. So what's wrong with that? So can I apply these results to the wireless network design? So it's very hard to do so. Because here, so in the MATI, so we have a very strict requirement on the time interval. It has to be less than that value. So I can never give such guarantees in the wireless network because I have always non-zero packet error probability. Okay? So how can I apply these results to the wireless network design? We basically had this uh, extended this idea to the stochastic method. So we analyzed many applications in the literature and practical applications, and they never give you MATI constraint because it's deterministic and it's not possible to do that in the wireless network design. So, but they give it in a different format. They say that probability uh, of time interval between subsequent state vectors, probability that it's less than a certain value, which we call MATI, should be greater than a minimum probability, okay? So this is kind of a probabilistic way of expressing this MATI constraint, okay? So you cannot definitely, so if it's one, then this is a deterministic constraint. So if it's less than one, then this will be a probabilistic constraint. Then you can apply it to the wireless network design, okay? So later on, we will, uh, I will show you how we applied it to the network design. So for now, just we focus on the control uh, system analysis. So we started with the hard sampling period. So remember, so we had this hard sampling period, soft sampling period, and the hard sampling period. So we assume that message delay is always less than the sampling period. So in the soft sampling period, so it can be greater than the uh, sampling period. So we are only interested in the eventual successful transmission of all messages, and we will use this data. So of course, the analysis is much harder than the hard sampling period case. And uh, uh, so we have this uh, derivation of recursive formulas of the augmented matrix of closed loop system. Again, there, there are many works on identifying MATI and MAT constraints. So when we go to the event triggered sampling, so up to now it was all about time triggered sampling. So event triggered sampling, so you remember from the uh, first part, so we have two types of control, event triggered control or self triggered control. In the event triggered control, if uh, the plant state deviates more than a threshold from the desired value, so then the sensor samples are generated. In the self triggered control, so this is like the predictor version. So you predict when the state will change, then wait until then, and then send the data, sample and send the data. So we need both a triggering mechanism for that and feedback control to generate comments. So in the, when you apply these ideas into the wireless network design, basically, uh, so in time triggered sampling, you can tolerate some of the message dropouts, right? So you generate a lot of data, but in event triggered and uh, self triggered control, you try to minimize the number of samples generated. You only generate the data when you actually need it. Then in that case, message loss and message delay are very important, right? So you have very little data. You have to send it with very uh, small packet error probability. So up to a certain point, up, uh, until a few years ago, so in this model, so nobody um, uh, was taking into account the message losses. Now there are many recent works, including this message loss, message delay uh, uh, in this models. Okay, so uh, this was the control design part. So let's continue with the wireless network design. But before I do that, I will give some background on the wireless network design and uh, um, layering. So have you heard of 
layering. Yes, okay. So uh, basically when you have a big wireless network, so you cannot design it all, right? So you have to, uh, layering is like functions, writing uh, functions in a, in a big software program, right? So what's special about layering? So we have these upper layers depending on the functionality of lower layers, okay? So at the bottom, so let me quickly review that. So at the bottom we have physical layer. So physical layer is more concerned about the transmission of bits. So you have a bit to be transmitted over the channel. How do you transmit it? So you basically use transmit waveforms. So each bit sequence corresponds to a transmit waveform. Then this transmit waveform is transmitted over the wireless channel. So, but you don't get that transmit waveform as is, right? So what you get on the other hand is a distorted version of that. So if you are talking about a wireless channel, so there will be many reflections around, then interference coming from other nodes, and also noise, right? So all of them, so what you get at the receiver actually is the distorted noisy version of the transmitted signal. And given that noisy signal, <coughs> basically you need to determine which bit is transmitted. And uh, <coughs> here uh, you have many, uh, you apply some modulations. And then uh, in the physical layer, it means that it's more concerned about the transmission of the bits. But it may be, uh, it's unreliable, especially if it's a wireless channel. So you have a certain modulation, basically you will have a certain bit error probability, non-zero bit error probability. So when you transmit packets, so you will have a non-zero packet error probability. Then we go up to the link layer. So link layer is still concerned about the uh, transmission, wireless transmission between a sender and receiver. Okay? So now at the physical layer, we had an unreliable link between the transmitter and receiver. So at the link layer, we try to make it reliable. So we put these bits into packets. So add some error correction codes. Okay? So even if some of the bits are in error, we try to correct them. So if we cannot correct them, maybe we resend these packets. All of these mechanisms are included in the link layer. So in addition to that, so wireless medium is a broadcast medium. Okay? So if other nodes around transmit at the same time, so it will affect your own transmission. So you have to take that into account. So you have to schedule their transmissions, understand whether they are transmitting or not, and this is called medium access control layer. So in the medium access control protocol, we determine how they transmit, okay? So physical and link layer basically is about the transmission, the direct transmission between sender and receiver. Now, what happens if they cannot talk to each other directly? So that's where the network layer uh, is. So basically in the network layer, if the transmitter and receiver cannot talk to each other directly, so you, they use the routers in between, then the question is which route is more efficient? So it depends on the routing metric, so energy efficient or delay efficient. And then um, we go up to the transport layer. Transport layer is more end-to-end. -end. So you have source and the destination, so they cannot talk to each other directly, so they use the routers, routes in between, but still some of the packets may be lost, so how do you take care of it? So these are all handled in the transport layer, then in the so we have applications on top of it. So uh, let me give you a little bit background on the physical layer. So what should we know about the physical layer? So we said that we have, when we transmit a waveform from the sender, basically, so we get a distorted noisy version of that signal, right? So we have, basically the receiver receives the actual signal, which is distorted, and also some noise and interference. And the performance of that link is determined by signal to noise plus interference ratio. So the ratio of the power, received power, the power of the actual signal that you are interested in, to the power of the noise and interference. So why are we interested in SANR? Because if you calculate the bit error rate, bit error probability, you will realize that for any modulation, that bit error probability depends on SANR, nothing else. 
So it doesn't depend on received power only, or it doesn't depend on N0 only. You will always see the dependence on the SANR. Okay, so this is one example. So you see the dependence on SANR. So if you do that for any modulation, you will see that dependence. So that's why, so if you want to say that, okay, my packet error probability should be greater than a certain number. So it corresponds to bit error probability being greater than a certain number or less than a certain number, then SANR being greater than a threshold, right? So you put a constraint on this bit error probability being greater than a certain number. So this corresponds to SANR being greater than a certain threshold. So that's why in the formulas you always give the requirement as SANR being greater than a certain threshold. So what does it mean intuitionally? So my received signal strength should be much larger than this noise and interference components, right? So that's why the requirement is usually is given in terms of SANR. So if uh, the receiver can receive one packet at a time, then you have one SANR threshold corresponding to a certain data rate. So if it can receive multiple packets at a time, then for each packet, so there will be a certain SANR threshold. Okay? So this is uh, what you should know about the physical layer. What about the link layer? So in the link layer, we said that we have medium access control protocol design. So it can be random access or schedule based. So what's random access or schedule based? So random access, the simplest random access protocol is actually ALOHA. So it's very simple. So when you have a packet, you transmit. You don't care about what other people do. Okay? So of course, if there are not many people around, it's sufficient. But if a lot of people are trying to transmit a lot of packets, you will have a lot of collisions. Okay? So a more efficient way of doing that is carrier sense multiple access. So in carrier sense multiple access, when a node has a packet to transmit, then it listens to the medium and it transmits if it is idle, if nobody else is transmitting. So if it's busy, it waits for a random back of time. And after random back of time, <coughs> it listens to the channel again. And uh, if it's idle, it transmits. Otherwise, it waits another random back of time. So the advantage here is that it's very easy to implement, but this advantage is that when you have a lot of nodes around, a lot of traffic, it's not efficient. So an alternative to random access is schedule-based protocol. So in schedule-based protocols, basically you allocate time slots to each user. So each user knows when to transmit and receive a packet. So they can put their radio in sleep mode if they are not supposed to transmit or receive any packet. So you eliminate collisions because you have full control on the transmission of the nodes in the network. So too good to be true. So what's, uh, what can be the inefficiency related to the schedule-based protocols? You need to discover the topology and the routes in the network, right? So to determine the schedule, basically, you need to learn the topology. So each node, so where they are, which nodes can interfere with each other, and how many packets do they, do they have. So you need to learn all that, and then you can schedule the transmissions. Then there is a scheduling overhead, and on top of that, you need to keep the nodes synchronized. Okay? So if two nodes are not synchronized, so this node will think that node one transmits here, the other one will think that it transmits here, so they are not aligned, so, uh, so there will be a lot of collisions. Okay? So basically, the time of the nodes should be aligned. And if they don't have good clocks, basically, it will drift over time. Okay? So you need to keep synchronizing these nodes. And you need some synchronization algorithm. So we have topology discovery overhead and synchronization overhead. But if this is a static network in some cases, so this might be the efficient way of doing that. So now with this background, so let's look at the wireless network standardization for control systems. So the most common protocol used at the physical layer and medium access control layer is IEEE 2.15.4 standard. So it's the most commonly used one. So after that, so it's very flexible. So to make it more specific, 
to uh, control systems. Basically, in 2007, so they proposed this virus heart standard. Then in 2009, ISA 111A. Then IEEE 2.15.4E is generated after that uh, with very similar features to this two. Okay. Then uh, we have also routing protocols, uh, routing uh, defined in uh, routing protocols defined in this uh, standards. So let me quickly review what this standardization is about. So I'll start with the IEEE 2.15.4. So in this protocol, basically. We have PAN coordinator, which is responsible of managing the network and many associated nodes. So we may have a star topology like this. So where PAN coordinator is in the middle and everyone, every node uh, talks to the PAN coordinator. Or we may have peer-to-peer -to -peer topology where nodes can communicate with any neighboring nodes, but still PAN coordinator coordinates all the transmissions. So in this standard, basically, we have multiple channels. So we have single channel is at uh, 868 MHz, then pan channels at 900 MHz, and also 2.4 GHz, we have 16 channels. So what these channels mean, basically, so they increase the flexibility of uh, scheduling, right? So one node can transmit simultaneously with another node at another frequency, right? So you can increase the number of uh, simultaneous transmissions in the network and make these transmissions more efficient. So this was the physical layer part. Then what about the channel access part? So you have two options. So frequently the first one is used. So I will go into uh, detail. So the second one is just simple random access protocol, CSMACI. So what's the first one? So in the first one, it's beacon enabled. So basically, you have beacon transmission at the beginning of the frame by PAN coordinator. So it identifies the PAN, so uh, basically synchronizes all the nodes there and determines the length of these time frames. Okay? So what do we have here? So we have active part where the transmission are, the tr the transmissions are, and we have inactive part here. Okay? And within the active part, we have a random access part and scheduled part. So basically, the standard is more like combination of random access and schedule based. Because in the standard, usually they don't give you the algorithm. Right? They, they just give you the underlying structure so that you can design your algorithms on top of it, depending on your application. So in the random access part, <coughs> which we call contention access period, Basically, if the nodes don't have any time critical data, they can just use this random access part. Or if there's a new node, so they send the request to the uh, PAN coordinator during this random access part. Then we have contention free period where we have access of time critical data frames. Okay? So we basically have schedule, so, uh, and uh, each node knows when to transmit so uh, that you can give some delay guarantees. So how does it work? So if you have non-time critical data, basically you have the beacon transmission. Then in the random access part, so this node tries to send this data. Okay? So it sends the data during the contention access period, then maybe they get some acknowledgement after that. But if we have time critical data, then the node somehow should ask for uh, the scheduling of the slot. Then what it does, so the device says that, OK, I want to be scheduled. So I, need, I need some delay guarantees, right? So it does that with this GTS request. Then, uh, and it has to do that in the random access part, OK? Because uh, the, the PAN coordinator doesn't know about the network, which nodes they are. So basically, uh, so it sends the request. Then it gets the acknowledgment from the PAN coordinator. And in the transmission of the next beacon, so within the beacon, actually the PAN coordinator uh, tells that device when it's supposed to transmit. So which time slot is allocated for that node. Then the node waits until it's allocated time slots, one of these GTSs, and it tr transmits the data, so without any collusion, and gets the acknowledgement. Okay. 
So now, depending on your application, so you may make this contention access part shorter and maybe contention free part longer. So you can adjust the length of these durations, the number of uh, time slots here, so which, uh, how they are allocated. So you should specify that depending on your application. So the standard gives you just the basic structure. Then in the contention access period, so what kind of protocol is used? So how do they communicate? So this is just a, a CSMACA protocol. So here what it does, so after some initialization, so it waits for a random back of time. And then do the carrier sensing, CCA is carrier sensing. Then it checks whether the channel is idle or not. Okay? So if it's idle, then it listens to the channel again, because here in a to dot, uh, 15.4, so to say that the channel is actually idle, so it has to be idle for two consecutive time slots. Okay? So if it's idle twice, then you can transmit, so the channel is idle. So if it's not idle, then you increase the back off time, and you back off again, and then do the carrier sensing and continue. So this was the general structure of IEEE 2.15.4. But it gives you some idea about how the systems should work. But that was not enough for control systems. So basically in 2007, so first wireless communication standard for uh, control applications has been released. So as a PHY and NAC layer, it uses IEEE 2.15.4 but puts more on top of it to guarantee the delay and message dropout, okay? So how does it do that? So now you see that we have two dimensional schedule, okay? So we have time slots, but for each time slot, actually, we can use simultaneously multiple frequency bands, okay? Then for each time slot, so we have one frequency band here, one here, one here, one here, right? So we can, we have a two dimensional, uh, scheme, so basically we can use each uh, time slot here. So for instance, a channel of set 3 and time slot 1, we schedule C to D transmission. So C waits until the uh, time slot 1, and then by using channel 3, so it can do the transmission. And uh, by including this frequency dimension, basically we can schedule more transmissions. So, but still that may not be enough. So there might be some interferences in some channels. So if I schedule A to B always on channel one, so maybe there's an, another application is using that channel and uh, it's never successful. So what am I going to do about it? So they also have ch some channel hopping mechanism. So what they do, basically they alternate channel for each packet transmission. So uh, if the transmission of node A was on channel 18, then it will be on another channel in the next time slot than in, on the next time slot. So that if one channel is, has a lot of interference, so still I can be, uh, this node can be successful in another channel. So there's also a channel blacklisting mechanism. So if certain channels are under high interference all the time, then the, there are some mechanisms to actually determine that and never use those channel bands in the, in the scheduling. Okay? So this is called channel blacklisting. So up to now, this was medium access control. So it also, wireless art also specifies routing. So source routing is like uh, you have a single route for each flow. And, uh, but the goal of the wireless network design for control system is always to improve reliability, right? So that's why they also introduce graph routing. So in graph routing, we have multiple redundant nodes between source and destination. So if this is the main road, uh, route, then we can have alternative routes, routes, right? So basically, if one link fails on one route, then the other routes will work, will still work, okay? So that's the idea. So usually the design of a wireless network 
for a control system is always about improving reliability by including these redundancies uh, in the network. So wireless heart was the first standard basically for communication uh, control systems. And uh, so it's followed in 2009 by ISA 111A. So it has very similar features to wireless heart, like channel hopping, channel blacklisting, but it's a little bit uh, more advanced, more adaptive than uh, the wireless heart. So for instance, channel hopping mechanism. So in wireless heart, we have slotted hopping where channel is varied in each time slot, so for each packet transmission. So this makes a little bit more adaptive saying that, okay, if there are new nodes or if the synchronization is not good enough for a node, so we may not have this channel hopping efficiently. So it also includes some slow hopping mechanism where the node stays in the same channel for a certain number of packet transmissions. Okay. So and it also includes a hybrid hopping where we have slotted hopping for uh, periodical messages and slow hopping for less predictable, predictable transmissions. So after wireless hard and I say 111A, basically now, so they're both depend on IEEE 8.15.4. So we started with IEEE 8.15.4. Then we said that wireless hard and ISA 111A puts some additional features to improve the reliability. Then after this, in 2012, uh, so IEEE 8.15.4 actually adapted these features and included in the standard. And it's called uh, 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 15.4E. So it has very similar features to wireless hard and ISA uh, 111A. So like slotted access, multi-channel communication, and frequency hopping. So it has some additional features. And uh, basically, there are three major MAC modes here, but the most frequently used is uh, TSCH. So here we have two types of slots. So dedicated slots, which mean, uh, means that so you dedicate it to a link. Okay? So uh, this slot is dedicated to the transmission from W to Z. But there may be some nodes which you don't know when they're going to generate the packet. right? So you don't want to allocate time slots to these nodes. So I might have like five links, but they transmit uh, once in a while, so not regularly. So how can I, uh, but still I want to allocate time, time slots to them. So what I do then, so I have some shared slots. So I say that this group of nodes are allocated this to this shared slot. And then if any of them have packets, so they can use that shared slot. Okay? Of course, there might be collisions, but if they transmit once in a while, then they, the probability that they transmit at the same time will be low. So uh, they can use shared slots. So there are also other MAC modes in uh, IEEE 8.15.4e. Uh, like DSME, where they increase number of time slots and frequency channels, or LLDN, where uh, they target lower frequency applications by uh, and reduce the overhead. So other standards, just uh, very quickly. So basically, we have these IPv6 packets, and uh, how can we use it in the uh, context of uh, IEEE 8.15.4 frames. So they basically had some efficient uh, compaction fragmentation mechanisms to adapt it to the wireless network, which means that uh, so they have very long headers, these IPv6 packets, and we don't want to use these large headers. So what we do, we uh, compress them. So if uh, some of the fields are not needed or have the same contents all the time, so you remove them and make it more efficient for the uh, wireless sensor networks. Then using this IPv6 routing protocol, so RPL uh, is proposed. So basically it's a, like a tree structure. Then uh, what's critical here, how do we uh, build this route? So what should be the routing metric? So uh, here routing metrics can be related to the delay, link quality, or connectivity. So I said that uh, the most frequently used standards uh, for the communication at the MAC and physical layers are IEEE 8.15.4, but there are also some work that use this IEEE 8.11 protocol. 
so actually this is not very energy efficient, so this is what uh, your laptops are using now. Uh, but uh, so there, there are some works on that. And uh, so the CSMA mechanism is a little bit different than 8.15.4. Uh, so 8.15.4 is more energy efficient. Uh, so here uh, they care more about the throughput rather than energy efficiency. And uh, in the uh, extension uh, 8.11e, basically we have different traffic categories to satisfy different uh, QoS requirements, uh, which means that, uh, so we talked about this random back off times. So if we have a high priority uh, class, then they wait less than low priority classes. So we, we uh, adapt their um, random back off times. So how much time do I have? Done? Okay. Okay, so then, yeah. I was actually at the end. So, um, okay, so what we will do then, so this was the review of wireless network standardization. So uh, what we will do next, basically, so we will continue with the key network parameters. So what's the effect? So what parameters have effect, basically, on the critical interactive variables that we've been talking about? So basically, how should we do the scheduling so that uh, we have a better control system performance? Or how should we adjust the parameters of the random access network so that we have a better control performance? So what does it mean? So we will analyze these relations in the, in the third part of the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Ask questions. If you're welcome, it's, it's okay. Anybody here can ask questions. <laughs> no questions. Either it was too clear or. <laughs> so so I, I want to ask a question about combining kind of these uh, different. Um, you gave an example, you know, you give some examples of combining. Uh, different different uh, access protocols? Access mm -hmm. protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what to call them patterns or, I mean, I, this is a, it's a dangerous word, but uh, ideas from different protocols together. Um, and the way we normally would do this is we sit down and we program, you know, something new that conceptually combines these things. Mm -hmm. But is there kind of, are there any frameworks that you're aware of or do you think it might be a good idea to have a framework for creating these things so we can experiment with them more easily? Because obviously it takes a long time to... You mean how to combine them in the best way? So uh, there are many protocols. So any protocol should combine them, right? So even if it's a schedule-based protocol, so it sh there should be some mechanism of learning the topology and that should be done by using random access Exactly. So, so, so to create many, many protocols can, can use them, but, but to create similar things such as the ones that you presented. Um, it takes a lot of work right now to, to create the com combined uh, protocol. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some, something that we could do to make it easier to create these kinds of combinations so that we can experiment with them? Because it seems to come up a lot that there are many benefits to combining uh, different kind of... So that's what the standardization does, actually. We have this IEEE 2.15.4, so they give you the basic structure for combining them. Okay. Then you just, I mean, change the parameters to determine the best way of combining them for your application. Okay, so the right? standards are presented in such a way that it's easy to... Yes, yes, to so they give them. you the basic structure. So okay. they say that, okay, so there's a random access part, there's a schedule-based part, uh, but I don't tell you how to schedule the nodes. Then okay. your algorithm should determine that. Okay, so uh, right now you're, you're saying in a way that the way it's done right now is as modular as, as we can yes, do it. Yes, 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 okay. you can do Very it. Very good. So, and then they have the basic CSMA CA mechanism for 8.15.4, so you use it for the random access. Mm -hmm. So you just need to adjust it for your application. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I found a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you started with the, the, talking about uh, the controller and the design, the parameters there, uh, and then you have this uh, 54 Tish. Uh, uh, have you an example where uh, a control system is actually in the world, not in, as an experiment or research, is actually used? So uh, the combination of 54 uh, TISH uh, with the control system, 
uh, is there out there any subjects open? Yes, while uh, building automation, industrial automation, there are many examples. Uh, actually. Yeah, uh, but concretely, uh, have you seen uh, someone documenting that they are actually using? Uh, so there this? were like companies, uh, dust networks uh, doing that, so they were very active in uh, specification of the wireless heart, so it was, uh, the founder was a Berkeley professor, Chris Pister. So uh, they basically had a lot of deployments, uh, industrial deployments. Uh, well, I don't know where they are exactly, but I, I knew I know that they had deployments, and they they use wireless heart, heart standard for that. Well, I was thinking that uh, because the the time slot length is like uh, five or ten milliseconds, um, mm -hmm. means that it's uh, yeah, hundred or two hundred hertz, uh, and if there are control loops that needs higher uh, sampling rate, then you cannot use it. And even if you have uh, like uh, 40 hertz or something, it's uh, difficult because you, you might want to slot this. So basically this standard is aiming that. So very low latency application. So how can you uh, have like 20 nodes every 10 milliseconds? So what they have, they have shorter Mac fra frames, so group acknowledgement, so many, many mechanisms. So j these are just examples. So this, this uh, Mac mode basically targets that. But I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure how frequently it's used. So this is the. Uh, so I see a lot of papers on that, mm -hmm. but not on the other one. So it's less frequently used, but maybe for some applications. Yeah. Also, a comment that in 154, uh, 2015, the TISH is included. In 2000. In sorry? the 2015 version of 15.4, the 4E is included. So. Uh, actually, we should not uh, talk about 4E. We should talk about 4, 15, 4 Tish. Oh, it's uh, it's not E. You are saying. Yes. Uh, well, E existed and uh, was there, but uh, now they now they included in the main okay. standard. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it until just a few months ago. So. How when was that? <laughs> 2015. 15. Oh, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. But I have seen a lot of papers. Yeah, yeah. Since then. There's a lot of people not knowing. Nobody <laughs> knows. <laughs> Communication is not being communicated. Let me give you so, papers on 15. So, so, for so. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, please, please. Yeah, yeah, no more. Oh, okay. So I just on this note, I just realized that now we have 25 minutes, 35 minutes for lunch which is a very small amount of time. Okay. So thank you very much, Sam. <laughs>